today's video, we're going to take a look at prayer. And the way that we're going to look at prayer is through the lens of Hannah. Now, I've done a Bible study on Hannah before. I think it was a girl boss video. If so, I will put that in the description box um, so that you can check it out. But we read about Hannah in 1 Samuel chapter 1. And I'm reading out of the NIV. There was a certain man from Ramathame, a Zophite, from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jerom, the son of Elu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, and Ephraimite. He had two wives. One was called Hannah and the other Peninnah. Peninnah had children, but Hannah had none. Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife, Penina, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave double portion because he loved her, and the Lord had closed her womb. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Her husband, Elkanah, would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Once they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And she made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me, and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will be ever used on his head. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, How long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. Not so, my lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Eli answered, Go in peace. May the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. She said, May your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went her way and ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. Early the next morning they arose and worshipped before the Lord, and then went back to their home at Ramah. Elkanah made love to his wife, Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah became pregnant and, be and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, because I asked the Lord for him. So when we start off, we meet Hannah and we learn about her story and it's pretty sad, um, especially when you take a look at the context of how important it was to have children at this time. Um, being uh, barren and not able to have children is, of course, something that women struggle with today. And it's really sad if you're wanting to have a child and you're unable to. Um, and back then, even more so, it was... Um, you were, you know, kind of like a social outcast, I guess, for a lack of a better word. I don't know. I'm, I'm losing my the word that I want to say. But um, back then, it was a huge deal um, because society really thrived on being able to have children. And actually, when I did a little bit of research, um, I found out that having two wives was actually not common then. Um, and it was only usually done when the first wife struggled with infertility and seeing that Hannah was listed first, if you look at verse two, um, and also that Elkanah loved her dearly in verse five, it's safe to assume that Hannah was probably Elkanah's first wife and they tried to get pregnant. She could not get pregnant and therefore to be able to, you know, carry on the lineage, Elkanah, um, had another wife and yeah, that's, that's the story of that. So.
Unfortunately for Hannah, when we go down to verse six, we read that unfortunately does she not only deal with the social stigma, social stigma of barrenness and not being able to have a child, but to top it all off, she was provoked by her rival, Penina. Penina? Penina? I'm sorry. I know I'm butchering all of these names, but that's not the point of the Bible study. So Penina was you know, a rival to her dear husband, had children with her husband. I can't even begin to imagine um, what that must feel like. That sounds horrific. Um, and she provoked her, you know, she probably said things like, well, I can have kids and, you know, your husband had to have me and, or whatever. Uh, who can, I can't even imagine what Penina said to her, but it got to the point where she cried and she wouldn't eat. So that's pretty intense. And actually, one thing that I just thought of right now is the word doesn't say anything about Hannah provoking Penina or retaliating in any way. Um, and so Hannah would seek the Lord. Every, well, they they would all go up yearly to the house of the Lord. Um, but there was no mention of Hannah retaliating or saying mean things to Penina. It sounds like Penina was just kind of picking on her and doing it in a way where she got no you know verbal um mistreatment from hannah in return um so that's just something that i thought of you know the character of hannah um This is reminding me a lot of, do you remember Sarah and Abraham when Sarah gave her, uh, made her handmaid um, Hagar to her husband Abraham? Um, Hagar and Sarah did not get along. Um, and, you know, that's because marriage was designed for two people. It was not designed for multiple people, you know, a relationship with um, husband and wife. And it's a union between the husband and the wife and, of course, the Lord. And so whenever anything else gets thrown into the mix, that's when conflict occurs. And unfortunately, because of the social stigma of the barrenness and just the social situations of this time, Hannah had to deal with that, um, you know, that rivalry with Penina. So that was verse six. Um, So here we are, we have Hannah, Penina, and Elkanah, another love triangle. So then we go on to verses 10 through 14, and I will reread those verses in particular. 
In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And she made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life and no razor will ever be used on his head. It said that she prayed with deep anguish. She was in pain Um, and she, you know, she asked God to remember her. And she said, you know, if you give me a son, I will dedicate his life to you. And that's really um, what we should be doing. You know, whenever God provides any good and perfect thing comes from above, any type of goodness, Um, even the little things like the other day I was, I'm sorry, I keep kicking the camera. The other day I was driving and I got to a place and the parking lot was full and someone pulled out and I got a really good parking spot. And I just said, thank you, Lord, because it sounds silly. It sounds minute, but every good thing comes from God. And so whenever we have something good, we should thank him and also bless others, pay it forward. And she was so um, anxiously wanting a son so deeply that she told God, I will commit his entire life back to you, God. You give me this blessing and I will give it right back to you for your glory and your service. Also in verse 11, she said that no razor will ever be used on his head. And I just wanted to talk about that for a second um, because I did look that up and I wanted to find out, you know, the significance of that. No razor. So um, I checked in my study Bible. I have a study Bible that um, explains really well the context and the culture. And I'll I'll have it linked in the description box if you're interested. I really enjoy that Bible a lot. But anyways... Um, So this actually coincided with the vow of the Nazarite. If you go to Numbers chapter 6, verses 1 through 5 in particular, there's the vow of the Nazarite. And basically with the Nazarite, it was was an optional vow that, you know, uh, someone can take, partake in um, to just separate themselves and consecrate themselves and dedicate themselves to the Lord. So it wasn't something that they had to do. It was optional. And this is very reminiscent of that. Hannah dedicated her uh, son, her her potential son, his entire life. And she said, you know, she will, a razor will never be used on his head. If you read Numbers 6 uh, verses 1 through 5 in particular, you'll read that that period of shaving one's head, or I'm sorry, that period of not shaving one's head is temporary. Um, It's just, you know, for that time that you wanted to dedicate to the Lord in that manner. Hannah just said, you know, for his entire life. So she went above and beyond, wanted to dedicate her son's entire life to the Lord.
So she didn't just say, you know, for the first five years or, you know, for how many years. She said no razor will ever be used on his head. And Nazarite, I looked on Britannica.com, it means to consecrate oneself to. So as we keep reading, Eli the high priest thought that she was drunk. That's how fervently she was praying. It says that Hannah was praying in her heart and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. So she was praying from her heart. We don't have to pray for others to hear. It doesn't have to be this... Um, you know, really loud and, and over the top prayer if it's not heartfelt. You know, what what does it mean if you're praying so that others can think, wow, they're, you know, praying really well versus what's in your heart. So H Hannah wasn't saying a word. She didn't say anything. Um, but she was just so committed and, and deeply passionate about her prayer and heartfelt desire and, and talking to God in that way that Eli thought she was drunk. That's how intensely she was praying. I am not a huge fan of these job pads. I remember I showed them in another video, but if anyone has any suggestions of really smooth colored gel pens, I don't know, maybe I'm just very picky. Um, but just let me know in the comments because I'm more than happy to try them out. Um, Hannah dedicated her son to the Lord and she used the Nazarite vow, but to like the highest extent, instead of saying, you know, I will do all of these things that's found in Numbers chapter 6. Um, for a period of time, she said that no razor will uh, touch his head for his life. So she dedicated her child's entire life to the Lord. She went above and beyond. Um, she really dedicated her son to the Lord. And then she was praying so intensely that Eli, the high priest, thought she was drunk. Uh, Hannah prayed fervently from the heart. She didn't care how she looked. She only focused on God. And that just made me reflect on my prayer life. Um, yes, I pray, but I think that it's super important to really write down the prayer, at least for me, um, write, it, write it down and continuously pray for it and praying for others too. Um, just really praying for others. You know, they have no idea I'm, I'm thinking about that or, or praying for them, but it doesn't matter. You know, God knows and God hears and he sees. Um, and it's important to look at Hannah and how dedicated she was to praying. I mean, it said year after year, she went up to the house of the Lord. So she was still praying, even though she saw nothing, you know, she didn't get her answered prayer yet. And I'm not saying that if you do what Hannah did, you will get your prayer for sure. You know, you would, your prayers will always be answered because, you know, we live in a very sad world because sin entered the world. Um, and I do want to just touch on too, uh, now that I'm bringing that up, um, God, you know, it says that God closed her womb. And I looked that up as well. And it said, you know, back then, that's all they thought, you know, when, when something like that happened, they thought it was because, you know, God did it. Um, when truly man brought sadness and sickness and, you know, barrenness into the world um, through our sin and, and disobedience, the first sin. And so, you know, God is the author of life. And his word says that, you know, we should be fruitful. And then that necessarily does not always mean with children, but children are included in that. And so God didn't close her womb. It was because sin had entered the world. That's why she was barren. And so I don't know what you're struggling with, you know, whoever's listening to this. And I don't know if you're going through a hard time and you're just kind of wondering why God did that to you. Um, but I'm so sorry, you know, if whatever you're going through and just know that God loves you. And he doesn't want any of this sadness and pain and suffering into the world, but it did enter the world, unfortunately, through the sin of man. 
Um, and so, you know, God only wants restoration and love and happiness and joy. And so Hannah prayed fervently from the heart. And even though she prayed uh, fervently, you know, I'm guessing that Hannah must have somehow had that peace of God that we read about, the peace of God that transcends all understanding in our hearts and in our minds towards Jesus Christ. Um, I imagine that she had that for her to endure that pain from Penenna for years, you know, it said years, um, and, and to be provoked like that. She prayed to God and what did it say after she prayed that she dried her eyes and she ate something. Um, that was before that her prayer was answered. So I just have to imagine that she endured that year after year, you know, day after day, she would just see Penenna with her children. She'd probably hear little remarks from Penenna, her rival, and she dedicated her life to God regardless. Yes, God did answer her prayer, but I think even if the Lord didn't, even if God did not bless Hannah with with a child, I really do believe she would have still gone up year after year and dedicated time to the Lord and prayed to God and, and served God. I really do. Um, she didn't retaliate to Penina. We didn't read of any of that. Um, she prayed to God, and after she prayed, she ate something and dried her eyes. It was as if she got that relief and peace that the word tells us that we get only if we rest in him and that is the power of prayer it's not you know necessarily yes bring your request to god but i think more so what we can get from prayer and i don't want this to sound like you know you have to get something from god i'm just saying when you go to god he will give you peace um and the text doesn't say that verbatim but i can only imagine that that's how hannah got her peace from all the, the barrenness and the sadness and the torture from her rival, Penina. Um, so anyways, reading on, Eli the high priest thought she was drunk. And in verse 17, he blessed her because she said, not so, my Lord, you know, I am not drunk. I am just praying very intensely. And he blessed her in verse 17. And again, you know, she didn't get her prayer answered yet. But when we read on the next morning, she worshiped the Lord. So... Um, clearly we can see that Hannah was dedicated to God regardless of what she had or did not have in her life. Um, and her dedication was even more so seen in her fervent prayer to God. It said early the next morning, she worshiped the Lord and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son and she named him Samuel. And when he was, um, three, Around the age of three, in verse 28, we read that she brought him up to the house of the Lord and she did exactly what she said she would do. She dedicated him to God.
So I know I didn't go on to read the next uh, book. However, if you go on, To 1 Samuel 2, you will read Hannah's prayer. She prayed before God answered. She went up, worshiped God, and sacrificed to the Lord year after year. She dedicated her life to God. She worshiped him despite her lack. She still worshiped God. And then after he answered her prayer, what did she do? She thanked. She rejoiced. Um, if you read 1 Samuel chapter uh, 2, verses 1 through 10, she thanked the Lord for answered prayer. This is also something that I need to do more often. Um, I know f a few weeks ago I got really sick and I just could not wait to feel better so that I can go on a walk and just not feel like I had to lay in bed all day. And I just prayed and I asked God, you know, Lord, please help me get better. And he did. And then I kind of just forgot all about it, took it for granted and went back living my normal life. And so there's so much value in stopping and thanking God for what he has provided. And like I said before, I, I do feel like Hannah would have continued to rejoice in the Lord anyways. I don't think she would have strayed from God or, I don't know, I, I just see her as someone who was super dedicated to God. And you can see how, you know, intensely she prayed and how she continued to just hold on to God. And I just pray for you that you will continue to hold on to God, that you will continue to pray and seek Him and that doing that you will find peace only the peace that you can get through him and resting in him so i just want to pray for everyone listening to this right now god i thank you for i thank you for this platform i thank you that there's a way that we can all connect and pray for each other and learn more about your word god i thank you for giving us that peace that we can only find in you we could be surrounded by chaos and stress and sadness, but when we find you and when we rest in you, you provide that amazing, wonderful rest and peace. And so God, I pray that anyone listening to this today, if they are seeking you and they are wanting peace, I pray that you just give that to them, Lord. I pray for peace in their hearts, peace in their lives, and that they will trust in you. Amen. I think below here what I'm going to do is just kind of journal and self-reflect and think about how I can incorporate, you know, Hannah's dedication and her example of prayer um, to God. And, you know, of course, reminding that, reminding myself the things that God has done in my life and just kind of journal here. And I just want to encourage you to journal here. What has God put on your heart today? What, um, you know, reading this story and, and studying this word, what do you feel like God is placing on your heart? Um, you can journal that and, you know, you can do your own Bible study off of that as well. So as always, I just want to thank you so much for watching. Um, please subscribe and turn on your notifications. I never say that, but turn it on because, you know, you never know. I want to start doing bonus videos randomly. And so you never know. So turn on your, your notifications. I post a new Bible study video on Wednesdays and Fridays at 7 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And I can't wait to study the Bible with you again. Bye. Thank you.